Hi everyone, welcome. I think we'll go ahead and get started. I'm Karen Lee Barkdahl, and I have the pleasure and honor of being the chair of the social work department. And I know it's been such an intense, busy semester. The Writers' Conference is going on this week. So I so many things competing for your time and attention. I really want to welcome students, faculty, and staff, because I see all of you represented here today for taking time to come to this lecture. We're so thrilled um, that this is possible. So I wanted to give you a little background about this. Then I'm going to introduce you to someone who will introduce our lecturer for the day. And we'll have a lovely time and have a refreshments afterwards. You'll maybe hear the cart coming in and rumbling next door around 1.15. And we're going to celebrate a little bit of Swedish fika um, following the, the, the lecture. So I hope you'll be able to stay and uh, visit with us and enjoy that as well. I also want to thank folks who were really instrumental in making this activity possible today. One of those folks is Brent Gerhardt who never likes to be the center of intention, but I want to say, Brent, you made this happen. Thanks for taking care of all the arrangements and for just um, making our department such a hospitable place. We appreciate you. And thanks to Dan, who's videotaping uh, and recording the event for us today, and to all the folks at the Chester Fritz Library. You've taken such good care of us. Thank you very much. This is such a lovely venue, and it's great to be back in here. It's been a couple of years. We're, so we're also here to celebrate social work because it's social work month. And some of you may not know that March is social work month, traditionally. And we had the great um, opportunity to have one of our faculty members, Professor Craig Burns, who's sitting up here in the second row, was instrumental in having the governor's office declare March social work month in North Dakota. That's absolutely incredible and it's something I'm understanding. <laughs> and not been successful, and a brand new faculty member achieved that, and so kudos to you, Craig. So, in a testament to the flexibility of our global partnership with Dr. Jonas Christensen, who you'll hear from soon, he upended his schedule, and we said, would you like to come? And we threw ourselves in a car, Stephanie Homestead, Craig, and <laughs> Jonas and I did a down and back a week ago Tuesday to the state capitol for a chance to have that photo opportunity and that official moment with the governor. And that was really amazing to get to um, have a chance to take Jonas to the state capitol, um, have him photographed with the governor. That was not on the plan for his two months here as our first ever international visiting faculty. So I think, I think that was really special and maybe meant to be. One of the, um, ch the chair of the Human Services Committee, actually, in the legislature, too, who's been a human service professional for about 25 years, um, Kathy Hogan, who Brett knows well, had the opportunity uh, and wherewithal, too, to, at the end of the photo op, say to the governor, will you please read it? And these are normally just photo ops. And he said, read it? And she said, yes, please. So he opened up the folder. And it was really affirming, and I took out my phone, and we have a recording, we're going to be posting that on the oh, college it's website. On. It's on, and ben, uh, Craig has been making it go viral already. <laughs> so we have the governor reading this wonderful proclamation that's authored by the National Association of Social Workers, reaffirming, reaffirming our universal and global social work values of social justice, of combating oppression and discrimination, of environmental justice, of caring for the vulnerable, of advocating for and with oppressed populations, and voting rights. That got read in the state capitol by the governor, and I'm kind of tearing up, and it was powerful. We had a good 25, 30 people there for that as well, many of them alums and partners and grants and other projects that were able to come on short notice from Bismarck. So it was really uplifting and wonderful, and I think frames this lecture Social work is a global profession. I've had an opportunity to go to a couple of international conferences and I'm so grateful for that. It was a game changer for me because I understood we get each other. Our roles, our titles, our opportunities may be different in different places, but wherever we're from, if you put a bunch of social workers in a room, there are congruent values and unity of mission and purpose about making this world a better and more just place for all peoples 
So I think it's very fitting that at the close of the Writers' Conference, there have been many social justice themes in this conference, that we get to hear from Dr. Christensen today. We're grateful that he's been instrumental in helping us be. I think it's true that we are the only formal international exchange program at UND. There are study abroad programs, but I think we are indeed the only formal exchange. We've had faculty support and take students, as some of you know, to Sweden for three years now to take their social policy class. Dr. Brett Weber, uh, Professor Barb Kitko, and Professor Rees, our field director, as well as helped students to complete field internships there. And now we're at the point of having our first visiting faculty from the program. And Jonas, without Jonas, we would not have this exchange program. He's been there from the beginning and has shepherded, shepherded this through and kept us making sure that all our I's are dotted and T's are crossed, right, Jonas? Glad he's been organized. So I also want to have a chance to um, introduce to you somebody who's been so supportive of research in the department, every activity of the department, and, and of the college and of us. Um, he also has a, a university-wide profile, so some of you may not have yet got to know Dr. Rashid Ahmed. And he's going to introduce Jonas, and I just want to acknowledge that um, he's made this, indeed, continue to be a wonderful place to work. And thank you for being here at the event today. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kennedy. Uh, I just want to have a few words before I talk about uh, Dr. Constitution. Uh, is you have a champion, real champion in your in your department, Dr. Kennedy. She always fights. She always champion about the social work, about the department, about the faculty member, about the students, everything, whatever it, you guys need it, whatever the environment you need, whatever the support you need. She always talk to us and she always supported and she always championed for that. So I really want to thank you, Dr. Bakhtel, for doing everything for your department here. So on the behalf of college and the University of North Dakota, I just want to th uh, th in, uh, thanks uh, to Dr. Christensen for accepting our offer to come and present this talk. I just want to briefly uh, introduce Dr. Christensen about uh, his bio. Dr. Christensen born and grown up in the county of Smaland, southern part of Sweden as you all know, home of IKEA, where actually, <laughs> <laughs> so, if you need anything from IKEA, you can talk to him. <laughs> where actually, the, Dr. Jonas has got his PhD in education, and he is a visiting professor at the University of North Dakota. His home university is Malmo University. And uh, He's basically, the research area is a, a research oriented, he's strongly dedicated to social and educational science, especially learning process in internationalization, in which he has published and also coordinated international projects. Dr. Jonas has been funded by EU in Inter, uh, uh, Interreg Title IV-A on elderly care in the Orissant region. He has also been funded by EU uh, Erasmus plus strategic partnership. He has more than 20 peer review publications and written many book chapters. And I'm extremely excited and honored to present you Dr. Jonas Christensen to present his work. Thank you very much and uh, most, most welcome. Uh, I would just like to start with to confirm what I've just heard uh, from uh, Dr. Bartal and, and uh, our D. Um, from the very beginning, I felt very, very welcome when I entered the door of the uh, Department of Social Work, the GLF building. Um, two days after, we had a staff meeting, or one day after, and uh, I presented myself and I said that uh, uh, this is not just a part of a visiting professor coming from Sweden entering a staff meeting at the Department of Social Work. It's also a part of the partnership. And partnership is much, much more than just to collaborate. Partnership is something much stronger. And uh, uh, feeling that you are a part of a professional family, that's also a part of our uh, ongoing process, started up in uh, 2015 in our collaboration. Uh, so uh, by saying this, most welcome. I would like to start with uh, a citation. 
you cannot discover new oceans until you have the courage to lose sight of the coast. Uh, this citation actually comes from uh, a Nobel Prize uh, winning literature, French, GD. And uh, for me, this is one of the core citations for me uh, if I go back into my professional life and private life. As you heard before, I'm grown up in the county of Småland. One million Swedes left Sweden over 100 years ago and they emigrated to USA, to America. One million, out of four million inhabitants. And they came mainly from the county where I'm grown up in that part, the poorest area of Sweden. They uh, didn't have so much. Uh, they left because they didn't have any alternative. They came to a new country. They fa faced clearly new challenges. They had left the whole family. They felt forced, many of them. Among them, my own grandfather. But they saw opportunities. And I think that when speaking about collaboration, when speaking about partnership, when speaking about uh, exchange, when speaking about knowledge acquisition, there are two words in my professional life which is very essential. And that's shared knowledge, giving and taking, but it's also about transparency. An open-minded attitude toward others' knowledge what's others' experiences. Never think that you are having the only solution or living in the best among countries or best among systems. There's always reflections to make in order to develop yourself. Could be yourself as an individual in a professional way. Could also be in sense of raising your own awareness and knowledge, meaning that it might be another way of dealing with your society or creating uh, systems or understanding the world of, for example, welfare, social system. Go outside your own comfort zone. And the question is, if I show this, do we focus on the trees or do we focus on the forest or what do we focus on? Do we uh, see maybe something total else than what's obvious? When you meet somebody else having the same interest in uh, professionalism as a social worker, for example, being a social worker, you connect. However, there are differences. When people meet, something happens. Go under the surface. When you compare a country like Sweden with the USA, it's so easy to say that it's like that there. It's like here, here. After three weeks, four weeks now of staying here in North Dakota, where I feel very privileged to be, I recognize that USA is minimum 52 countries, not one country. Within the state of North Dakota, there are differences. We speak in Sweden about the Nordic the Scandinavian welfare system. I'm against that. I don't like to speak about systems. Because under the surface, you have a lot of similarities, but also differences. Sweden is in many, many ways more marketized than maybe the most capitalistic country in the world, namely USA. We are much more marketized in parts of the welfare system than I knew before I came here, in many ways. Uh, within the state of North Dakota, I recognize that you have a number of regulations very unfamiliar to me. And um, what I'm saying is that don't just judge, don't just look on the surface, go under the surface. We are facing a growing number of universal challenges. On my desk, in Malmö, at the Malmö University. I'm having a, a, a plate, uh, and you're having the EU flag, and in the middle it says, in Europe we are all foreigners. We could replace it and say that 
on earth, we are all foreigners, regardless of where you are, regardless of where you come from. We are facing a number of universal challenges, uh, both on a, what you could say on a local level, but also on a global level, politically, economically, socially, technologically, environmentally. And uh, I'm fully convinced about that. We need more, not less, of what we could say is interdisciplinary and contextual understanding in our professions. In our professions, and about our professions, and between our professions. And in this, higher education becomes even more and more important. And that, when speaking about internationalization, it uh, needs to uh, be institution-wide. Because there is, the, in the world of the universities, a tendency that when speaking about internationalization, it's a thing for the international office. Go to the international office, they take care of the agreements and everything. Yeah, that's one thing. But humans being, col be, uh, uh, humans collaborate. They create partnership, face-to-face. -face. Students meet, it's about face-to-face. It's about making th things happen, implementation. We need the international office, that's not what I'm saying. But what we need is think institution-wide. And uh, that internationalization in itself is a never-ending, stopping process. It's an ongoing process. And nobody is alone. Uh, we need each other's experiences, we need to raise our awareness, we need to criticize ourselves, we need to reflect, and we need to develop our contextual understanding, skills and knowledge. And regardless of our willingness uh, to feel and be independent, because when we speak about freedom, feeling, being independent, that's a strength to say that. On the other hand side, you're never alone. You need each other. We need each other. So independence and dependency belong to each other. So we are in many ways dependent on each other. And that shared knowledge, as I mentioned before, and transparency towards others, strengthen yourself, strengthen our professional understanding and capacity. And when we, we then relate this into partnerships, that partnership raise the understanding and analysis of common challenges, it gives definitely an added value. Then it's another thing to ask, so what do we mean by added value? Added value could mean different things, but that it gives an added value, for sure. In the long term, the short term, in the long term. Uh, since 2014-15, you and in my home university, <coughs> having them as well before for Dr. Baca, established a partnership. Uh, it's about exchange, students and faculty, act locally and develop the global awareness, professionalism. And given this background, how we in the uh, University of Tatota position ourselves and strategically develop collaboration will then, out of this background, be even more important, not less. Why? Well, it will be even more important in relationship to how we understand our institution capacity, how we develop our institutional capacity. Uh, it's about our education and research. It's about our collegial understanding. We need both to work from a bottom-up perspective, but also from the top-down perspective. And, in concrete terms, how do we develop, how do we make this visible in our syllabuses, in our guidelines? This makes what we call internationalization at home. Internationalization at home 
mean start where you are. You don't necessarily have to go abroad. Going abroad is a part, strengthen this. But internationalization at home also means in concrete terms. How in concrete terms do we make collaboration, internationalization visible at home? One of my key words in my, my research is the word co-opetition. Are you familiar with that? Is it understandable in English? It's a combination of competition and collaboration. There is no contradiction between competition and collaboration. Not necessary. Because what does it mean in the combination? Well, it means that in some areas we collaborate. We need to collaborate. But we, at the same time, also compete. Um, and uh, our competitive capacity is as important as our collaborative capacity. And also, with a question mark, how do we recognize having experiences due to internationalization, due to the local understanding of community where you are, in relationship to global awareness, making it visible. In my home university, we have recently started up recognizing students' experiences in this field by offering them the possibility to have a supplement to the, uh, to the, the uh, when they are graduated, and it's called CIM, Certificate of International Merits, and we have a, a, a process with very clear criteria, and a couple of months before the graduation, they have to finalize individual a report, a reflective report, which will then be, uh, in a qualitative way, uh, looked up on from the faculty and so on, and that's a supplement. That's a part of making it visible, to recognize. So, if we may call this the first part of the input of the background. I would now invite you. I would now like to invite you going abroad, overseas, to two Scandinavian countries. There are three, as you know, Norway, Denmark, Sweden. We will now move to Copenhagen and Malmö, a cross-border region connecting two countries. Denmark and Sweden, and um, being recognized as two welfare societies, Denmark having the highest taxes in the world, Sweden number two, if that's interesting, I don't know. <laughs> it takes 25 minutes from my office to go to Denmark, to another country. Seems to be quite similar on the surface when comparing, when speaking about Scandinavia and so on. There are significant differences between Denmark and Sweden. Out of money aspects, I won't go them through in detail and so on. What I'm saying is that now we move to the cross-border region of Denmark and Sweden. Uh, and this region could be called the transnational region of Malmö, Copenhagen, connecting the capital of Denmark with Malmö down south in Sweden. Meaning that Malmö is in the periphery in our country in relationship to the capital of Stockholm, but in the center of a region, a cross-border region, having around 4 million inhabitants, having very high concentration of food industry, pharma industry, IT industry, <coughs> What we're doing now is that we go into a concrete example out of the empirical experiences we have done through the collaboration so far, because it's in progress. It's a process. So I have now picked up a topic, a theme, which is a very clear example of shared knowledge, open your eyes, compare, but also reflect which affects us all, namely the field of migration. Migration studies, 
the theme of migration. And uh, I then relate this field out of a local perspective from the city of Malmö. I come from a city where the Malmö University is located, having 180 nationalities represented in one city. It's a highly segregated city. Um, however, also a very dynamic city. And geographically, it's located, as I mentioned before, in a very high concentrated cross-border region, where then Sweden and Denmark meet. There are around 20 higher education institutions within the distance of one hour from my university. It's the, 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 the highest concentration of higher education in the European Union. Uh, this region might be called a very clear example of something named a CCC region. <coughs> this comes out of research saying that when you have the components of culture, communication, competence, then you can measure how much of this do you have in a region and then you can compare it with other regions. This region has a very high level of those components. Uh, Denmark and Sweden are having very different migration policies in many ways. Uh, even though we belong to the same social welfare system. And the migration issue in itself, as you know, can be understood, analyzed, and seen up on both a local level, where we are, on a regional, but it can definitely be seen as a global issue. Why do I use this as an example? Why do I focus on migration? Well, that's because that migration is a permanent part of the short-term course we are offering in Malmö, inviting around 50 social worker students coming to Malmö from seven, eight different countries, including Swedish local students. Speaking about migration is a very concrete and good example on the importance of having both the local understanding, local knowledge, and global awareness. Uh, and in addition to this, diversity of knowledge and experiences then, when people meet, is in many ways needed to uh, raise awareness and knowledge about the migration issue. Because there is also a hidden complexity of challenges. There is a hidden complexity of challenges which you can't just face by reading the literature or reading the chapter that the nut number saying that in Scandinavia it looks like this, or in the U.S. say it looks like this. There is a complexity of challenges. And uh, reflections out of this integrated in the classroom where practice, research, and education meet, together with local student groups, not just the international students joining, coming to, to Malmö, but also other students, makes a difference. And that the partnership in itself, where students, practitioners, and researchers meet, gives an added value, coming back to the added value, uh, which would probably not have been possible to reach elsewhere. Could be developed, how to reach it in different ways, but the meeting in itself, the meeting place in itself, gives an added value. And uh, let me then put in the second citation. It's through encounters between individuals of diverse backgrounds, cultures, and frameworks that we are challenged in our notions, not least in learning environments and educational contexts. Why do I use this? Well, when you and these students, together with students from other societies, countries meet, we learn from each other, a learning process occurs uh, out of a transnational, cross-border, regional perspective. And this is what we could see. 
And something occurs when the diversity of eyes and ears meet. Something happens, and you know it. You all know it when something happens, when you meet somebody you haven't met before. What happens then in the classroom? Well, there is an added value, which can be seen out of cultural awareness. You might be more aware of your own background by meeting others representing other backgrounds. There is a cross-cultural competence in this. And I say that sharing knowledge and comparing is a competence in itself. We can speak about a competence in comparison, comparative competence that critical opportunities will be not just possible, but just the exploration and understanding of critical opportunities. And that the opportunity of being and the possibility of being the other one in relationship to the others means something. When you are sitting together with students coming from a number of countries and you have a case and it might be quite obvious what the case is about. But how we solve this case, yeah, that might be also quite uh, similar, how we face the, the, the uh, uh, case in itself, the solution. But something happens because we are having different traditions, we are having different methods, we are having different solution orientations. And the development and develop a greater commitment to social justice mean that we could definitely confirm that we are all, uh, all agree, regardless of where in the world we come from. But we meet in the classroom in mind. The development and develop the understanding of differences in social welfare can be organized in different ways. And as I mentioned before, when we speak, when we raise the complexity of uh, welfare in comparison, and I raise the word marketized welfare state of Sweden, something <laughs> happens when giving ex some concrete examples on how it looks like in a country like Sweden, then mm -hmm. very, very much of the, the, on the surface, in the rhetoric, in the political discussion, makes it a little bit complex. It's not just that easy to say that it looks like that there, and here it looks like this. Uh, the enhancement of students' competence through developing social values, strengthening your own values, your own social values, and not at least strengthening your own professional identity. Who are you? Uh, insights into one's values and beliefs. You meet others, you discuss, you reflect. You also meet practitioners coming from the local field. And that uh, the questioning of cultural assumptions means something. Never take anything for granted. Always think that it might be a very efficient and good way to try to understand other opinions. And the translation of practices. How do you work in practice? So, I will make a, a short break there before I go on. Any question marks? Any, anything you want me to, to repeat or is it so understandable? Should we go back to Ikea maybe? <laughs> <laughs> you know that uh, in uh, the Swedish uh, history, Brent, I know that you are a historian. After the Second World War, it was said that our prime minister at that time, a social democratic prime minister, he said that it was uh, seen that he created the, the, the people's home of Sweden, and IKEA furnished it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not just giving examples of a politician in IKEA here, because the symbolic behind this is actually the core of development of the Swedish society. 
And that's the combination of the state, the market, and the capitalism in many ways. So it's not just an expression. Any questions before we go on? Anything you want to? Is it interesting? Do you? Yeah? I wonder if you could just develop what you mean by a marketized welfare state. Yeah. I, I don't think we understand no, that that's, that's what very, Sweden is. Very good that you raised that question. Uh, let me start with, uh, when, this, when you are in Sweden and, and, and you, uh, uh, you speak about uh, maybe we, we should uh, have a look on how it looks in, in other countries and so on. Maybe you should uh, learn from, 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 from others. We tend to, in many ways, be very narrow-minded. We are having the best, in a normative way, solution to do this and this. We are having created the best family policy and so on. We don't need to learn from others and so on. Uh, then you might hear in Sweden that, well, we don't want to compare ourselves with the United States. <coughs> in Europe, there is a big diversity and big complexity in how we organize our societies. And then when we raise the understanding of our two countries, United States and Sweden, then we are having a view on USA as being not um, uh, state, uh, no state interference, that uh, it's the market who decides, it's a very capitalistic society and everything. If you go under the surface in Sweden, there are only two countries in the world where profit-based companies are allowed to run schools, profit-based and tax-financed, and that's Chile and Sweden. In the primary school system in Sweden and the high school system, we're having a washer system, meaning that you, the parents, they can choose whatever school to go to, and it's tax-financed, but you have a freedom of choice. There's a full competition between publicly run schools, privately run schools, and NGO-run schools on the primary school and the high school system. When I gave this, and we discussed about this, it seems to be quite unknown from the American horizon. And there is a clash between the view we are having about Sweden and this kind of system. We have been very successful companies on the stock market in Sweden, running schools, profit-based. 40 to 50 percent of the LED care in Sweden is private, privately run companies, profit-based, tax financed, in competition with publicly run schools. We have in 290 municipalities, and in a part of those municipalities, they don't allow home-based care to be a thing for the users to choose among. It's defined and decided by the municipality that it must be public. Then you go to the other municipality, a neighboring, there you have a full competition among private, public, home-based companies. We're speaking about the same country. I'm giving examples of under the surface, we are having a marketized view on the social, the welfare system. We are very individualized on the one hand side. On the other hand side, we strongly believe in the collective way of having the tax financed system. So we divide very clearly about how we organize and how we finance. The social insurance system, we're speaking about private insurances and so on. Around half of the Swedes having private health care insurances in addition to pay, paying the high taxes going to the health care. So we are having two parallel systems. Since 15, 20 years back, there has been a growing, growing demand of private health care insurances, like in the US, in combination to paying high taxes, having the full access to the health care. Why? Well, we are having huge problems with waiting lists and queues to the healthcare, the access to the healthcare, meaning that for the employers and for individuals, it's much, much more efficient to buy their own private insurances. But here, there is a clash between the universal principles of having the welfare system on the one hand side, on the other hand side, letting the market grow. Only a couple of examples. 
I can give you a, a, a number of more examples. But is it so understandable? Yeah. What I mean with the marketized welfare system? Um, we know from research that international experiences enhance cognitive skills more than social skills. And this is actually directly taken out of uh, research being done by the European Association of International Education. And a capacity to hold a more global perspective on local issues is a very essential for. So by saying this, is that we need to explore more about the outcome of new reflective and reflexive knowledge in relation to professional practice. But why? Well, international experience matters for employers this is the reason behind why we have introduced this Certificate of International Merits, making it visible, having recognition. Uh, if graduates can transform skills in behaviors that are observable and translatable into value-added workplace performance. So our students in the social work program, for example, during the fifth semester, they have in 20 weeks internship, they have the freedom to go abroad during the internship, coming back. They are having the possibility to go abroad in their studies during semester four and seven, go abroad anywhere. And uh, in addition to that, doing that, they're having a supplement, a certificate of international merit, showing that for the employer. Uh, so, as we heard before, we meet around 50 students from um, several higher education institutions and universities each spring term since 10 years back. It's two weeks campus-based. We focus on social welfare issues. It's very clearly interdisciplinary. Uh, the facilitators represent different disciplines, subjects, and there is a core of interdisciplinarity when we create the, the uh, uh, team of facilitators. You understand? If I may, yeah. would, would you be willing to describe, uh, you mentioned in, uh, a moment ago, the fifth semester. Yeah. Um, uh, can you describe the, the Swedish social work uh, yeah. programs I can uh, do. In, in, in relation to what yeah. you know about ours? Yeah. Uh, because this is a very specific module uh, that takes place within the much larger scope of exactly. uh, your, your program. So yeah. how long does it take a, a social work student? First of all, in contradiction to your, your, what you are having here, where you have a more, I would say we can learn a lot from you, when it comes to an integrative approach, when it comes to how to integrate internships and placement, and, and never, I would say, lose the contact with the students. That's what I've understood. You have a clear long-term relationships out in different ways. Seven semesters. That's the, 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 what the social work program looks like in Sweden. Seven semesters. After three semesters, you're having the fourth, where you can go abroad and study. And the placement and the internship is only concentrated to one full semester, 20 weeks full time. And during those 20 weeks full time, you can stay either locally in Sweden or you can go abroad. And during the sixth semester, we're having the essay semester, you could say, where we write our thesis work and so on, then you can choose to go abroad. During 8 to 12 weeks you can go abroad and uh, receive a scholarship where you make your empirical study somewhere else. In the seventh semester, that's actually uh, when we're having our elective courses. And elective courses mean that you can focus then on migration, uh, children and welfare, aging, elderly issues, and so on, in combination of a second thesis work. So that's basically the, the undergraduate program. And it looks basically the same all over Sweden. It's very, uh, it's nationalized, and it's a very general program, like your program is very general. Our program is it as, as well. It didn't used to be that way 10 years ago. We had different directions, so after th three semesters you could choose into certain directions. That's not possible anymore. So more of a generalized uh, program. This also makes it much more challenging because 
we see more and more examples of that we need more in-depth knowledge. We need to connect, we need to attract our former students coming back, doing the master studies and so on. I spoke with my head of department this morning, we had a Skype meeting. I, with six hours time difference, I had to plan it. Um, and uh, uh, we now discussed to develop a master course in leadership. Um, and uh, master course in leadership connecting with our former students because now they can't come back to us because we don't offer it. We don't have one course, one hour with leadership in our social work program. Uh, so that's the social work program. Can then I, we're having. Could I clarify yes. something? Yeah. Um, students who come to the MoMA University to study social work, they come there and all they take are social work classes. Yeah. There's no ongoing math or liberal arts or anything. No. Nope. This is focused on just social work. Yeah. The first three semesters, social work coursework. Yeah. A fourth semester is a field placement or internship. No, the fourth semester is also theoretical studies, but you can choose to go abroad and do your courses abroad. I see. Yeah. Uh, and then how many field placements do they do? Just a uh, they only do one. And which semester is that? Fifth semester. The fifth. Yeah. And then they return for additional coursework. Yeah. Uh, and electives which are uh, kind of uh, incorporated into our coursework. Um, come at the very end. Yeah, so now you're ready, you've had all of your generalist training, you're ready to specialize, you take an elective in yeah. that area of specialty yeah. at the very end. But, but I, I wouldn't call it specialization, because okay. it's only uh, half a semester. The other half of, during the seventh semester, you do another thesis work. But you can, you can profile yourself, you could say. Hmm. And then during the third semester, I don't know, that, I don't think that you have the same. Then we speak about social law. The whole third semester is so about social legislation, law. And you are not allowed to go abroad during the fourth semester if you haven't passed the whole third semester. You have to pass all the courses focusing on social law, law otherwise you're not allowed to go abroad. You're not allowed to go and, and, and study anywhere else. So and social law, is this the, the legislative Legislation process? due to social legislation. I see. And it's about uh, basically then on the national level, but it's also about the EU legislation, partly. We have, as you know, uh, the High Court in Sweden. Above the High Court, we have the EU Court. Among the 28 or from next Friday, eventually, 27 <laughs> countries. Uh, we have the EU Court. And that's in Luxembourg. So uh, uh, let me also, as a, a challenge-based approach, that's something which we develop a lot, meaning that we define clear societal problems, bring them into the classroom, and work with that problem out of problem-based learning, entrepreneurial learning, collaborative learning. So challenge-based learning might be seen more of a, a, an umbrella term then it's not a method in itself. It's a theoretically based approach. Uh, integrated with local students in social studies, meaning that we invite, we integrate from other, other programs, not just the social work, also social pedagogy and, and, and uh, some other student groups. We're having, for example, from our faculty of uh, or Center for Migration Studies. We invite students from them. Uh, and then, in addition, and this also makes sense when speaking about partnership and collaboration, that it's also very developing for the facilitators. Because we come from different um, universities. Uh, we come from the UK, Germany, Austria, United States, and some other countries. We collaborate. We learn from each other in a professional way, on place in Malmö. Uh, we also invite local practitioners. So I'm having a colleague of mine, for example, he's from Chicago, he's married to Swedish, uh, speaks Swedish, and he runs a refugee home in Malmö. And he is invited into the classroom, and last time now, we also went to this place. And he then has got his one and a half or two days in the classroom where we discuss, where we reflect, and so on. So the mixture of thematic le sessions, lectures, and workshops. 
And let me then point out the reflective and the reflexive part. Being reflective, that you raise your own awareness, you reflect by being in another environment where you haven't been before. You step out of your own comfort zone. You raise your understanding out of a reflective perspective. If something that happens and it makes you change your way or maybe dealing in relationship to certain situations, you change your maybe your own understanding in depth and so on, then we can speak about the reflexive part. And uh, both is something we are in many ways aware of. The students that make the paper assignments, after two days, uh, two weeks, sorry, in Malmö, all students making their presentations, then they come back, go back to their home universities, make their paper assignments, having supervision. And in addition, of course, we are having research-based publications. Uh, we are now into uh, uh, one of those publications. Any, if I may say, reflections <laughs> before I go on? So, yeah. every student has to do two kinds of research. One is uh, before semester five, and then they do after semester seven, too. Yeah. And they have to be the different one, or they have to be the same? They can be continuation of one each other. Um, do you speak about our social work program yeah, now? Yeah. Uh, that could be totally separate. They, they could be placed in, in, a, in, in a placement in the internship. They have the supervisor there and supervising from the department. They do that on place. Uh, that doesn't has, uh, it doesn't have ne ne uh, anything to do with the, the, it must not have anything to do with the FA topic. Actually, uh, a minority of the students connect. I think there is a big potential in this, but a minority do it. Uh, I mentioned before that during the sixth semester, our students having the possibility of going abroad. We are having something called minor field studies. It's financed by the authority, how do you say in English, the authority for aid and, 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 and support by third world countries and, and developing countries. That's the authority. They finance this. But the students, they apply locally within the university in order to go abroad for 8 to 12 weeks. They can choose among 50 countries around the world, classified as so-called minor field studies countries. So they can do that during the sixth semester. But that's scholarship based. Uh, any more? I've been curious. Yeah? Um, have you noticed any major differences between North Dakota and normal Sweden that has stuck out? Either through the UND or social program or North Dakota as a whole. Yeah, you mean since I arrived here? Yes. A lot. A lot of reflections. <laughs> uh, I, I, I have my own diary. <laughs> but I won't tell you what, what I put in it. <laughs> <laughs> Every day I make my notes, my reflections, <coughs> and I must say that there are a lot of reflective uh, uh, parts coming into my mind. Uh, you are much more community based. Uh, you are um, in many ways in a collaborative way. That's what I've seen here at least. Uh, you, are, um, you are not having this border thinking in the same way. Maybe within the university. I'm not the person to, to answer on that. But what I'm saying is that when going out in the community, I've been in, in some uh, placements here and, and uh, facilitates uh, uh, and, and so on. And, uh, I'm, uh, met uh, different kinds of people during the, the week so far, and also internally. So I can say that uh, there are less examples where I have confirmed my view of the United States, or being in North Dakota, than I would have imagined. I said there are less examples where I could say to myself, that, oh, yeah, I, di I didn't know this before. This just confirmed my own uh, pre-knowledge and so on. There are less such examples than the opposite. And uh, this, I, I, yeah, I, I, have, um, I have a number of different examples. Um, I went, for example, to the church on Sunday, last Sunday. 
uh, to the church and, and uh, participated in the worship. And when listening then to, do you say the priest? Yeah. Is it? Oh, okay. No, I, okay, I, I didn't tell you what church, but was it, was it Lutheran church? So it was the priest. Pastor. Pastor, exactly. Pastor. We actually, we, we made a pastor, a pastor in, in a church which is not recognized as being the, the federal church. In the free churches, we call them pastors. But anyway, by names, he told us how it looks like with those and those members of the church when it comes to their health status. Mm -hmm. There are um, um, he or she um, having those and those difficulties, surgeries and operations and everything. I can tell you, out of a cultural uh, way of, of comparing, this would have been impossible in the federal church, at least in Sweden. I don't know how it looks like in all the other churches. But it, it gave me a feeling of being very close to, to what I listened to. On, on the one hand side, when speaking about integrity, I'm active in the church in Sweden. If I would have told the, 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 the priest there uh, that, uh, why don't you mention the, the members by name? Uh, this would have been unthinkable. When you say a uh, federal church, there's, there's a Catholic church and the uh, Church of Sweden, yeah. state church. Let, let me explain. Until the year 2000, we had the Swedish uh, church uh, named, uh, yeah, the Swedish state church. Every Swede, more or less, they had to be a member of that church until the year 2000. Uh, since then, we don't have that anymore. But still, 60% of the Swedes belong to that church. So that's why I'm yeah, comparing. But that, that's one uh, example. But the main examples I am having is more about the social policy and the regulations and the interference. Now I'm in North Dakota. I know that it looks might look differently in another state, neighboring state. Um, I've got friends in Minnesota and can compare and so on, so I see similarities here. But, but this... Um, uh, interference of, 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 of the state of North Dakota and, and regulations and, and uh, um, extremely strictly when it comes to the alcohol and, and, and policy and so on, uh, at least on the surface, I don't know, uh, yeah, but <laughs> uh, at least in, in rhetoric and so on, a, a number of such examples. And in this way, we are more, if you uh, understand me right, more liberal mm -hmm. in our way. Uh, Much more. I, I, I can only buy liquor in Sweden at a state liquor store. Let me then. Yes. Very good, friend. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I thank you. You have. Yeah, you have done that. Yeah. yeah and very expensive. Yeah. Uh, highly taxed. Let me then use that as an example of the Swedish. <laughs> yeah, but let me I use heard. that as an example of the Swedish. <laughs> that's an example of the Swedish paradox. Ninety percent of Swedes support having a monopoly when it comes to liquor. Selling of liquor, sales of liquor, 90%. If you look up on the consumption of alcohol in Sweden, around 50% of all what's consumed in Sweden is bought in Sweden. 50% comes from Germany or Denmark, neighboring, because it's much cheaper than. So we support both the Swedish welfare state by our high taxes, having this monopoly. It sounds very good, because then we can say that, look, we're having efficient alcohol policy. But half of the Swedes, the consumption is purchased from Germany and Denmark. A booze cruise. A booze cruise. <laughs> <laughs> when, it, when it comes to <laughs> booze cruise. When it comes to drug policy, yeah, the thing is that in North Dakota, as far as I understand, I can't go in a food store and buy a beer. That you can do in Sweden. Up to 3.5 percentage of alcohol, you can buy it in any food store you want. Another example is drug policy. Sweden, probably having the most rigid drug policy in Europe, hasn't changed one millimeter. It's a criminal act, nothing else, using drugs. And the mortality is going up, up, up in Sweden. So if you compare, for example, Sweden and Holland, Holland being recognized as maybe the most liberal uh, country when it comes to drug policy in Europe, they are having less, less mortality than Sweden. 
And uh, yeah, here we can problematize. I can give you an example out of other campus and so on. Uh, a long answer, reply, a short question. Yeah? We're sorry, we're yes. losing some people who have to get to other class. Yeah, yes, I, I fully understand. I fully, I don't take it personal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Could we back up to, you yeah. said 60% uh, of the Swedes belong to the state church. Yeah. Um, but it, it's my understanding that this belonging um, takes place in when they pay their taxes annually. Yeah. There's a small percentage that goes to the church. Yeah, it's percentage. But otherwise, very few Swedes yeah. actually go to church except for maybe their children's yeah. uh, christening exactly. and, and wedding. Yeah. Uh, not Christmas or Easter, just no, those no, two no, events no, in their no, life. Yeah. <laughs> and Sweden is, Sweden is in the research recognized as being the most secularized country in the world. You never speak about religion, you never speak about the church in the official uh, language, so to say, when it comes to how to deal with challenges in the society. But religion plays a more important role than ever in the Swedish society, due to our, not least, our multicultural society, in many ways. But you, you would never speak about religion and so on. And uh, the thing is that if you belong to this uh, former then state church, so to say, then you pay, as you mentioned, a certain percentage. I pay, for example, $500 a year. But the thing is that even though it's not compulsory anymore to belong to this church, this church takes care of social services uh, when it comes to, how do you, uh, what do you call it, a register for, for the, the national register of, of the population. My understanding is that even with the cradle-to-grave welfare state, yeah. people fall through the cracks. The church exactly. uh, picks up that. Yeah, they do. They yes. do. And uh, they also support uh, when it comes to funerals, for example. And, and, and uh, uh, if you want to get married, then you have to receive the permission from, from this register and so on. They take care of this. So uh, may I summarize? And conclude. Mm -hmm. And the conclusions and the summary mm -hmm. is actually made out of both, of course, our empirical experiences, but also out of our research and so on. So far, we need more research. And that is that shared perspectives, values, and face to face meeting in a new environment definitely develop one's own professional identity or understanding of identity. <coughs> And that the creation of community of practice, you're all familiar with the community of practice? When you create a common arena where you meet, could be a big diversity among the actors, among the members. What we have done during the years is that we have created a community of practice on place in Malmö through this collaboration. And this impact studies learning and the understanding and development of reflective and reflexive capacity. Diversity in itself is a key component in learning outcomes and that the environment factors provides a unique added value to knowledge acquisition for professional social construction by the meeting in itself. Uh, one might ask, well, couldn't we have done this uh, web-based? Uh, the thing is that the face-to-face -face meeting makes something else with ourselves when we meet on place. We can always add, we can always develop and so on, uh, the meetings in itself, but this is what we have seen. And that the understanding of cross-cultural knowledge and professional identity in relation to one's own reflections adds, and this is another key word of mine, and that's the local knowledge. Uh, the connection between the local understanding and the global awareness and that value to professional practice. And that knowledge acquisition through the stimulation of just being in a new meeting place in culture creates a framework for learning about the professional discipline. And uh, adding again, the community of practice in international study program may, I say may, positively impact student learning and create a more when around practitioners, we look upon our own reality, our own practice, 
partly with other eyes. And in what way, to what extent, we need more research. Strategic collaboration must be built up on trust. Among us as facilitators, we need to not just go along with each other. We also need to have a transparent attitude to our collaboration. Even though we are having our agreements and so on, we need to trust each other. We need to structure our two weeks in a very clear way. There is enormous lot of job behind this. Uh, since 10 years back, and uh, we start in September, October to plan it each year. It's also about transparency and sustainability, that it takes time. It takes time to establish a community of practice in profession, in progress. And uh, this might be seen as a case in a partnership, but it's only one part of a partnership, and a partnership could be a number of other kinds of collaboration as well. However, we need to know more. We need to um, make, for example, more of follow-up studies and so on. But we also need to, in a UND partnership, strategic way, also add one plus one makes three in the long term run. So we need to know more, we need to give our uh, collaboration, and we also need to extend and, and uh, uh, yeah, by saying this, I would once again thank my colleague Brett. You have been with us now since three or four years. I have met uh, the uh, Department of Social Work, the colleagues, and uh, I feel that <coughs> we need each other in different ways. We had a meeting, uh, a dean, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I can also uh, add that out of a UND perspective, uh, don't underestimate in a more and more challenging global world that this is very essential, how we also further on step by step develop. <coughs> So, um, but we need both to collaborate on the, from the bottom up and from the top down. And, um, yeah. That's, uh, <laughs> we had some questions before and so on, but maybe there are more reflections. Yeah, I've been talking so yeah. much, but if I may kick it off with the... No problem. Um, we're currently uh, working on a, uh, an article yep. together, um, and one of the things that we did, it's an article based upon a, a classroom exercise experiment we, we conducted last year. Um, one of the things that we observed is students come together and they focus on how different their uh, social welfare systems are, social uh, work education is. At first they focus on how different everyone is, and then we gave them case studies. And uh, despite all of this emphasis on difference, when it came time to do a case study, they very rapidly came together and, and solved it using uh, shared values, perspectives, and methodology. And you said something at the beginning uh, that uh, we welcome students to our professional family uh, on an international level. And it, it really came home for me watching those uh, case studies being solved that uh, the, the emergent professional identity uh, was shared across borders from very different systems. Could, could you speak on that? Possibly. can only uh, confirm that. Also, uh, I, 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 I do believe that it's very essential that we analyze our differences before we go into what we have in common. Because if we underestimate the differences, then there might be a lack of understanding when we ask ourselves, how come that we didn't solve this? How come that we didn't reach this solution, and so on? But with the cases, for example, it showed very clearly that regardless of where you come from, you have a universal professional uh, understanding of your core values, and that makes it, you have the accessibility, 
uh, around the solution, the understanding, and so on. However, never underestimate the pre, uh, uh, both the pre-knowledge, but also the, the previews you're having of each other coming into a new environment. It's the same thing when you as a social worker meet your client for the very first time, and the user. The client also having eyes, uh, frame of reference, uh, views on what does it mean meeting you. So never underestimate this from the early beginning. Be aware of it. But this is also part of the learning process. And the thing is that when then adding a nurse, when adding a police, when adding a, an engineer, when adding an economist into this interdisciplinary group of solving problems, this is what we are also developing and I, I strongly believe in, because the world outside here looks in that way. You need to collaborate. You need to share each other's ears and eyes. And um, so, so, so there, is a, there is a hidden, there is an obvious um, learning process in this. And uh, yeah. Oh, um, so you were talking about the concentration of kind of the higher education institutions within that hour. Um, do you find that there's more collaboration than competition there versus the United States, where it feels like there is kind of a sense of competition always, whether it be economic or research funding, yeah. things of that nature? I'm glad that you're asking. Uh, we had a vision uh, 20, almost 20 years ago. As you might know, we're having a bridge connecting Copenhagen and Malmö. And after that bridge, we said in, in, in the region where I come from that let's collaborate. Let's make it possible uh, in the morning to attend a lecture in Denmark during the day in Sweden and then back in Denmark and create net-based, uh, not net-based, but uh, networking among the universities. It took a number of years, and then there was a clash between the Danish and the Swedish educational system. Does it correlate to each other? Two EU membership countries? Does it work? So we gave it up. So there is much less of a collaboration today than it should be. However, I would like to add that in Brussels, half a year ago, Five southern Swedish universities established an office in Brussels, hired, employed a guy, a Swedish guy, who used to work for the Scottish Innovation Fund. And his purpose, being there, is only to make lobbying and connection to research and education and serving five southern Swedish universities. But this took time, because we collaborate with the North oldest university in the Nordic countries, over 400 years of age, together with us only having 20 years of history. So there are hidden structural uh, obstacles, but also opportunities. But we're having a common office today. Uh, but in answering your, your, your question, um, no, I would say uh, uh, very, very, very little uh, collaboration between the universities. However, uh, outside the region, we collaborate a lot. I'm running a network in ten, year, 10 years back, where we're having six universities in five countries. And it seems to be much easier for many of those partners and colleagues to collaborate outside their own university than seeing the potential within the university, where, where, between faculty, between colleges. Uh, so, and this is not unique for us, I guess. <laughs> No. If, I, if, I, if, I, if, I, if I may add. But what I mean is that one plus one makes, could be more than three in many ways. So um, the professional family, understanding of professional family, I think that's a very good expression. <coughs> this. Um, yeah. Any more reflections? Yeah. So. Yeah. So for, let's say for a student in Grand Fox in North Dakota, why should, you've said a lot about the global and the local, but why should I, if, if this is what I'm going to stay in practice, why should this even be of concern or of importance to me, considering how relatively homogeneous 
Yeah. Um, the thing is that uh, if you if you be in another environment than you are used to, you have in your um, you have reflections bringing uh, from another environment into your own professional field of, of understanding. Then it something happens. It, it develops yourself in different ways. Uh, and um, we had, for example, uh, you're from Ghana. Yeah. Yeah. We had for, for eight years we had a collaboration with the University of Accra, the capital of Ghana. Yeah. We had it on continuously once a year students from our side going to Ghana, making the internships, and after that they made the reflections and they affected the local Swedish students in a way which wouldn't have been possible without having this experience from those students. And uh, what kind of reflections? Well, it was not out of a normative way, saying that uh, let's do it like this. They transferred reflections to the Swedish local students, which was extremely valuable. And one example, how do you define the family in Ghana in relationship to how we define it locally? We are having enormously growing challenges with loneliness among elderly, among older people. Uh, now I go to another country in Europe, and that might be maybe the poorest country in Europe, and that's Moldova. Are you familiar with the country named Moldova? It's between Russia, Romania, and Ukraine. I work with a, a fellow female colleague from Moldova three years ago started up the project and I invited her, she collaborated and so on. And I wanted to interview her. So I started with a question, Aliona, what can we learn from Moldova? And we, by we I meant not just from the Swedish side, also from our Danish and, and the Finnish and yeah, the Scandinavian side. What can we learn from Moldova? She, during 15 years, of research experience had never received this question because she was so used of learning, adopting from others because she belonged to the poorest country in Europe. It took her 10, 15 minutes and then she started to, we spoke and so on, and then she started to ask, Jonas, there is one thing uh, which sticks into my mind and that is you speak so much about loneliness, social loneliness and so on. We are not familiar with that in Moldova. And then she gave examples on how meeting places are created. Cross-border meeting places in small villages, in the cities, where, where uh, elderly meet uh, young kids and so on. And then the research says that there are two countries in Europe having the most developed cross, do you call it cross-border meeting places? Do you see what I mean? Generation meeting generations, yeah, yeah. could be in a community house or anywhere. That's Belgium and Moldova. And on the surface, two totally different countries. What does this mean? Well, it meant that she transferred knowledge to us as researchers, collaborating, having created a view on that, well, we are having this system and, and uh, um, uh, we, 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 we need to transfer our knowledge to others and so on. The same goes in relationship to your question. Do you see also what I'm trying to? So, uh, yeah, if there is nothing more, then I would like to thank you once again for your attention. And thank you, not at least, for inviting me. Thank you, on behalf of Dr. Rotter, uh, for invitation. So, uh, thank you. Thank you, Jonas, so much for sharing what, what, what I know is such an enlightening presentation. You're having me reflect about the fact that not only has our partnership enriched students and faculty in our department in so many ways, but it, I, you're having me reflect upon how it has enriched the institution and what I'll do with those reflections. So appreciate your lecture, your time, your journey with us and allowing us to share that journey with you. We are going to convene next door then. Please come over for 
I think we need a quick lesson about Fika. Yeah, let me, uh, uh, Brent, you, you have been with me from the very first day I arrived in Grand Fox together with Jackie, Jackie and uh, I'm very pleased for your support in many ways. But you announced that there will be something named FIKA now taking place. And FIKA is the Swedish word. It's at the core of the Swedish culture, having a coffee break. <laughs> having a break in a certain time and, and then connecting and, and, and so on. So I'm very pleased. If you want to have a FIKA uh, not meeting a Swedish guy, then go to IKEA. <laughs> <laughs> May I also add that there is another Swedish word. Uh, that's ombudsman. Huh? Ombudsman is a Swedish word. Oh, it has yes. been exported. So when it's, be, uh, it's about terminology, then we are proud of those two words. <laughs> <laughs> and Smörgåsbord comes from Denmark. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very pleased uh, to hear that you offer a fika. Yeah. Yeah. Right. In the next room, right? Yeah. Yes. Thanks, everyone. Please join us.